Project Doc here coming at you with my good friend Tim Kennedy. Uh, Always a pleasure to be here. How you feeling today? It's Thursday. Yeah. And um, three training sessions today, two yesterday, two Tuesday, two um, Monday, and then I did a really long ruck run mm -hmm. on Sunday. Uh, so feeling it. Mm -hmm. It's been hot as hell okay. here in, in Texas. Um, but really good. Yeah. Like uh, during this morning strength and conditioning session, we did uh, what we call the Holy Trinity, which was this. It sounds very unholy, actually. It was not holy. A lot of a lot of people call it the trifecta of death, or the um, the uh, what's the Bermuda Triangle, the Devil's Pitchfork. Yeah, <laughs> uh, involved rowing, sprints, and airdyne bikes. So not great things that task you muscularly no, and but intense cardio. Yeah, yeah. massively. Yeah. So there, there were these benchmarks that you had to be able to finish each of the individual events and then cumulatively be, be able to beat all of the time together and, uh, and I, you know, broke records, uh -huh. like type thing. And then the guys I was training with, I crushed their souls, and then I ate their souls, and then I pooped out their souls, and I tried to make them eat their own soul. And uh, Interesting analogy. So even though my body, I know my body is fatigued and, mm -hmm. and taxed, I'm still putting out good volume of output good today for me so today was day uh four my fourth day in a row doing that new kettlebell routine i was mm. telling you about so uh crushed my soul the very first day yeah intensely crushed it and the second day was even worse third day was a little bit better and then i was actually dreading today because of how much harder it's only two workouts and you just alternate back and mm. forth Knowing how intense that second workout is, I was dreading it yeah. and really surprised myself at how much easier it was. My form was better. Um, I had the advantage uh, in there early on of watching myself in a mirror when I was doing it. So really critiquing my form, having really good form today. Uh, and yeah, it, it wrung me out completely, but... God, I felt so good afterwards. I had, uh, in fact, Denise even said something because she's about 30 minutes later, she said, you're still on your endorphin high, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Because I felt so good about it. Because yeah. you, just, you just feel, when you kick your own ass, you just feel that good about it. You it's a good but, feeling. But you bring up a lot of good points. And, and I want to say right out of the gate that I don't typically do, like uh, I'm doing this as kind of a load right now where I'm just alternating between these two basic workouts in uh, early on because I have a very short-term goal that I want to reach and I know what my map is to get there. But that's not something that I would typically do because I typically go for more variety in my workout routine. And that's something I wanted to talk to you about today is, uh, you know, a lot of guys, I'm 51. I've been, you know, long SF career, injured a lot. You know, a lot of times I was in some type of recovery. And I know you as a professional athlete, I've seen firsthand some of your injuries. So I know the type of things that you've nursed in training camp, uh, injuries that you've gotten during fights, um, things that you've gotten from doing crazy SF stuff and, and just training and everything like that. That's what we should talk about. Let's talk about injuries. Mm, man, I hate them. But they are part of the life of being a defender of being a warrior, yes. of being an operator, of being a fighter, of being all the things that uh, value and appreciate human life and want to protect it, um, injuries are without a doubt commonplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not a bad thing. No, and it, you should expect to, if you don't, if you go through life with no aches and pains, then you're not put. Then you're not training hard enough. No. You you are not pushing yourself hard enough if you don't have aches and pains. Yeah, your 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 body, your muscles, your bones, your heart, and your brain, all kind of work similarly in the sense that you hurt them so badly that your body is like, man, that really sucked. Mm -hmm. You hurt me so bad. I have to be stronger so that I don't get hurt as bad if I do the same workout again. Right. That's how muscles work. Right. That's how, I think that's how the heart, when I say heart, not only like cardiovascularly, but also like mm -hmm. that little, yeah. I'm yeah. gonna quit thing yeah. inside of you. If you're not task taxing it, if you're not testing it, if you're not breaking it, then you're not pushing hard enough. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. And you have to know, there's, there's a fine line between 
the discomfort that comes with hard training and the pain that comes with damage. Mm -hmm. And that's, you have to know that. I think for me, the key going in, and people, I get asked this a ton, and I know you do too. And just recently, we, we had an email string uh, from one of our former students uh, talking specifically about injuries and about what you do to rehab and things like that. And I think one of the, the most important things, and this is, you know, for me, prior to this, the workout routine that I'm on now, I had a sedentary period of a few weeks going into this. So knowing that I can't go on day one back in the gym, I can't do what I was doing two weeks ago. No matter who you are and no matter what your state of fitness and your fitness goals are, starting by first knowing realistically what your state of fitness is on that day. If you are the guy who was a high school jock for years and then you took four years off and ate a lot of Subway and now you're going back into Planet Fitness, don't think you're going to put the same number of plates on the bench and do that same workout that you did in high school. You have to have a realistic expectation. I mean, haven't you found that that's true? Yeah. I've never had periods of life where I wasn't training. I've, I've been limited by what I was able to do by where I was. You know, if I was in Afghanistan or Iraq, I remember doing squats with transmissions mm -hmm. and um, throwing parts and tires as far as I could as my workout. Um, unlike today where I'm at on it, you know, where I have like the most expensive equipment that's made specifically for the fitness, the fitness industry. So, you, so you've done the entire Rocky four spectrums from Sylvester Stallone in the barn to, uh, to Drago in yeah. the state of the art Soviet facility. Minus the steroids. <laughs> I haven't done that, but I've chased the chicken without a doubt. I've run the steps and, um, you know, the really tacky track suit nailed that for sure. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, um, having the right program and having the right approach and having the might, the right perspective and mentality about why you're there. You know, what is motivating you for being there? And is that motivation going to be good enough to keep you in there and push you to that place where you're going to get faster, stronger, and ultimately harder to kill? Yeah. And, and I think you, you bring up a great point. If, uh, and, and this is a great illustration of, of the, uh, the distance between the two of us. So great example. Um, you, Tim Kennedy, professional athlete, also with hours, days, weeks, months, years of both formal, formal and informal education in fitness, it's, it's a little bit easier for you to say, I'm going to go pick up that transmission or that bell housing or, or, or that axle, that truck axle. And I'm going to find a way to make that work than it necessarily is for me. Somebody who's a little bit more junior in their fitness IQ, that might be a little bit more of a recipe for a disaster in my opinion. But I think if you are going to do something like that, you have to set up your parameters, you know, uh, recognize what kind of shoes are on your feet, recognize what kind of surface you're standing on, recognize is the surface level or not, you know, and I see, you know, the, this kettlebell workout that I'm doing is a great example because the guy that designed it, when you see the videos of him doing it, he's doing it barefoot on the beach. Now he's been doing this routine for a very long time. And that's actually a pretty good place to be doing it. I mean, it's, it's actually pretty forgiving in a lot of ways. It makes you work a lot of proprioceptive muscles that you normally don't work in shoes on a flat surface. But I would caution everybody, because one of the things that I was going to illustrate today, and you, you kind of gun deck that right out of the water, but that's okay, is, is proper equipment. But you illustrate the point that if you have the fitness IQ, any equipment can be the proper equipment. Yeah. You know, th there is something for the adage of uh, stupid strong. You know, there, the, um, you know, there's the other expressions, uh, my, microaggression expression coming right, right, right up here, uh, retard strong. Yeah. You're like that, that is, that is somebody that is just inherently, it's a thing. it is a thing. <laughs> and, uh, and I can't believe I said microaggression, but uh, a true millennial is just pop, pop in their ears are popping. Like, Oh my God, Tim, 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 the, there are times where you have to just do the work that you're not going to be in the gym. You're not going to have the air conditioning. You're not going to have the right shoes. I can't tell you how many times I've worked out in combat boots and ranger panties, you know, where I walked out and I asked and I sourced off of the local people in whatever country I was working in. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, can I get 
a 50 gallon drum and I want you to fill it up one third with sand and then drill a hole through it so I could put a bar in it so I could use that as my deadlift or I could use that as my squat or mm -hmm. I could use that as, I mean, you, I got really primal, but then, you know, I'm at Elevate in New Mexico with Olympic lifting conditioning PhDs or at Atomic or at On It. Um, and that full spectrum, the thing that was constant and the commonality between all of them was my desire to get bigger, to get stronger, to get faster, to get a better improved version of myself was always present. Mm -hmm. And like there has to be a cognitive awareness of where you are. You know, like we, in the she, one of the number one in the sheepdog uh, mantra mm -hmm. is awareness. Yeah. Like aware of yourself. You know, your own limitations, your own assets. You know, you might be really good at something. You might be really bad at something. You might be really good at running and really bad at swimming. Whatever they are, um, you have to have that level of self-awareness. And then with that, with that general awareness, you got to do the work. Mm -hmm. And you got to get after it. And you got to get jacked up hands like mine right now and sore knees like mine right now. And, uh, and then do all the things to get better faster so that then you can do the you can do more work the next day. Mm -hmm. We've, in the course of my lifetime, we've seen this incredible uh, loop that's kind of come around. You know, I, I think back to what I thought of as fitness when I first became aware of it as a, as a kid growing up in the 1970s. And you think of good old fashioned dumbbells and medicine balls and guys in gray sweats and, you know, uh, you know, gyms that smelled like sweat and leather and steel, and that was where people got stronger. And then it morphed its way into the into the 80s. Most people probably don't even, listening, probably don't even remember the Nautilus machines. Oh, I remember those. Which were these, imagine this huge, this massive, incredibly heavy, incredibly complex, and incredibly expensive machine that's desired, designed to work one muscle and one muscle only. Because that was the thing for the longest time is we have to isolate all these muscles. You know, that's a, you know, a, a curl machine that only curls in one way, a, pulled, a rowing machine that only works your lats in this fashion. And we became very, and, and that was kind of the age of the explosion of the Mr. Olympia and the definition of individual muscles, where everyone was all focused on this this exercise or this machine works this muscle and nothing else. And you had to very carefully structure your working. You know, this is my arm day. This is my shoulder day. This is my chest day. This is my tricep day. This is my whatever day. And of course, they were all skipping leg day. We know that. And that went on for a long time. And now we've kind of come full circle back. We're back. You know, we had, you know, Pilates had this big explosion and of course CrossFit, this big explosion. And we're back to this functional fitness. Yeah which is more what you need to do. I mean, for the type of things that we talk about, picking stuff up and climbing up over stuff and getting yourself in and out of situations as you need to, that's the type of thing that we're talking about. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's really good to see that it's kind of come back around to that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, with the, pro the, the advantage, you know, in looking back on these Nautilus machines is you strapped in or you had these big padded things and it would completely isolate everything, including your joints, to the fact that all you were doing was putting tension on one muscle, and it made it very, very hard to hurt yourself. But because you weren't, you were using prime, what we call prime movers only. You weren't using any of these accessory muscles, any of these proprioceptive muscles. So you might have looked good in beach season, but if you really had to pull somebody out of a burning building, afterwards you're going to realize you pulled about eight muscles that you didn't even know you had. Yeah. The during the, the era of the late 80s and early 90s, you would, uh, in the Nautilus era, um, I don't even remember the, the, the thing that had all the different bars that you would hook cables on and it would actually move like a, a, a um, like individual springs, which was insane. There was a reduced chance of you getting hurt while you're in the gym, but if you went to go and do something, there was a much greater chance right. of you damaging or injuring yourself. So if you wanted gym muscles, it was great. Yep. If you wanted sheepdog muscles, it was terrible. But now, inversely, you have guys getting hurt more in training, but getting injured less at work. So there's this trade-off, and, and that's okay. There's times where I would rather know my limitations and my breaking points and understand my assets and what I'm bringing to the table and be damaging myself in training, not to a degree that it's, it's impeding 
my overall growth in the trajectory of how I am as a human and as an athlete, still continuing that upward trajectory and getting hurt sometimes, having bumps and having bruises, having taken my licks and that happening in the gym or in training so that when I go and drag somebody out of that burning building, I'm not going to pull my lat. Yeah. I'm not going to pull my back. I'm not going to blow my knee out. You know, like I could, everybody that's in this room right now with us, if a bomb went off in the bathroom, I can grab all of us and throw them on my back and carry us out, you know, because I know my capability and I know what my breaking point is and it's not what it is in here right now. Um, but with that, with that awareness of, I realize I'm going to hurt myself, you have to have the building blocks, those little small steps, the, um, the pillars, the cornerstones of what it means to be an athlete, what it means to be a warrior. I get really mad right now when different fitness brands try to own like the word functional fitness, mm -hmm. you know, like a kettlebell is a thousand years old. Yeah. You know, CrossFit did not invent it. No. They've been using it for a thousand years. The Spartans were doing sandbag get-ups yeah. before <laughs> there was a brand on the sandbag. Right. You know, like they, they, they were doing body weight Turkish get-ups or, or Turkish get-ups with spears or with weights even. Mm -hmm. Like the Samurais were doing like, none or, of this is new. Or with a calf that eventually grew into a full-size bull. Whatever, <laughs> whatever that legend is, the guy who walked yeah. into the stadium, he was doing get-ups. 100%. He was doing... He was doing Cow get-ups. That was <laughs> 1,800 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is not a reinvented wheel. No. Trying to push the human body to its limit so it can get stronger, and that limit moves. What you could have done yesterday, and you push yourself to that breaking point, the very next day, that point has moved. Mm -hmm. If you could go to 9, and that was when you died, and you went to 8.9, mm -hmm. the very next day, you can go to nine because your nine is now a 9.1. Yes. And that will continue to move the harder you push yourself if you are doing all of the other little tiny things correctly. Mm -hmm. The diet, the recovery, the sleeping, the sex, the work, all those things you have to be doing. Well, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the whole general approach. So let's talk pre and we've talked, we've talked about diet before, so we won't belabor that too much. But so pre-workout, you get up on a workout day. What, what do you do as far as warm-up? What are you willing to do when you're cold? And how do you address your warm-up and your stretch prior to work? So um, that's a fun, fun question. We have what is called our cold bore zero as a sniper. When I pull the trigger, that very first round or two that comes out of my barrel warms my barrel up so then my barrel will shoot consistently and accurately once my barrel's been warmed the human body is very similar i know what i am able to do cold i know what i can if you use right now you said tim go run a mile i know what i can do it in i know how long it's going to take me to warm up and i know how long i'll be able to nail it at and then i can come back in and um, not have pulled something or I also know what it, I can go and warm up, do my stretches, do get, get in, flush out some of that lactic acid, get my heart racing, get my lungs full. So then when you say go, I'm already barely broken a sweat and off I go and I'm a good 45 seconds to a minute faster than my cold mile time. The, that, that's that, that self-awareness. The limitations of being cold and what you're gonna do in your warm up is gonna depend on every athlete and their amount of mileage on their body. Um, you, at your age, and the injuries and the lifestyle that, that you, Mike, have had, you know, you should warm up a little bit longer than I should. And I try to. Yeah. <laughs> and then the 23-year-old that, you know, he's a NCAA swimmer, and, you know, he just got done with his, his four years of swimming at university of some snobby school, um, he does not need to warm up as long as 37 year old, 15 years in special forces, Tim Kennedy. Um, you know, and, and there's degrees and, and spaces in between there, but everybody needs to warm up, but to different degrees and in different ways. Yeah. When I think about what I could do at age 21 on three hours sleep with a hangover mm. or maybe even still drunk mm -hmm. to go out to Ranger Battalion PT, mm. No way I could do that now. No, I would so, die. Yeah, definitely need more warm up. So, and, and you you bring up a lot of great points. Is when you are cold. So when when you uh, the best illustration that I can give with 
give with this is my I have two bulldogs. And when they first wake up and I go over and I scratch their ears, their ears are stone cold because while they're asleep, they're shunting all the blood basically to the vital organs. They're in sleep mode. Mm -hmm. Their heart rate goes down. Their respirations go down. They don't have, you know, think about when you wake up, you know, what's one of the first things you do when you wake up when you, and you get out of bed? You stretch, right? You've been laying a certain way. The blood flow to a lot of your, uh, a lot of your prime movers has been limited. Um, you've been laying down so certain joints actually expand when you're laying down and going to sleep. Like you, your, uh, uh, your vertebral discs actually expand at night. They suck up more, more of the moisture in your system and they tend to expand. Your paraspinous muscles relax. You're technically a little bit taller when you first get out of bed in the morning. Some of the other joints, though, are a little bit on the dry side. So your knees, your shoulders, your wrists, your elbows, there's not as much synovial fluid moving in those. And a little bit of movement is what, and that's why all the good workout programs, you know, you'll see, you'll be doing some general movement to get that, you know, to, and it's not just the amount of synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is very viscous. So it's like the oil in your car. It's much different if it's cold synovial fluid as opposed to warm synovial fluid. As it warms up, it, it's, it moves around the joint a little bit more. It's not quite as thick, and it does its job Is a this bit the better. same lubrication that exists during sex? It's not. Okay. Yeah. Because that's better when it's warm as well. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's Dang. a totally different show, so okay. we're not going to get into that. <laughs> I love how Tim waits, waits until my minor children are in the room before he starts dropping things. Yeah, I mean, but... <laughs> lube is good just in general like when i first wake up in the morning um i pound this man i think it's like maybe 20 ounces of water you know i've been fasting for the time that i've been asleep and um put a bunch of good liquids back into flush yeah, all your the cells are hungry when you wake up they need it yeah. and then uh you know my pre-workout is three egg whites a little bit of oatmeal with some fruit and a cup of coffee. Then I hop in the car, I have an apple, and I drive to the gym. And I get to the gym, and I crush everybody's idea of what it meant to be an athlete. And uh, no, no, no spiking, caffeinated, energy, weird mixture, yeah. powder. All those weird pre-workouts out there that people do. Dangerous. You know, that's, you, know you see that video... Uh, there's that video that always pops up on Facebook all the time, and it's uh, like it's a video of I think the Ultimate Warrior running to the ring in, in WWE, and it says uh, when you get to the gym and your pre workout kicks in, you yeah. know, and it, if your pre workout is making you do that, you're getting caffeine, taurine, and sugar basically, which other than putting yourself at very 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 high risk of having a cardiac arrhythmia, you're really not doing yourself any favor because none of that is fuel. Hmm. No, they're all stimulants, but none of that is fuel. And everything you just described, so protein, so that's that's going to be a building block that you're already going to have on hand to rebuild. You're talking about steel-cut oats, which are a complex carbohydrate, which mm -hmm. you're going to need for energy throughout that workout. And the apple, which is two things. So that's a little bit more of a simple sugar. That's fructose. So that's more readily available. So that's going to be your quick pathway. Your, all your quick twitch is going to tap into that right away. And there's a lot of water in that apple too. And there's fiber, which is going to help you with all the other stuff that you just consumed. And I'm really old school and I'll tell you, and I do this wrong, is my big thing is my first workout of the day, and you know this, and we've talked about this, and Tim hates that I do this. I like to work out on an empty stomach. Other than water, I like to work out on an empty stomach first thing of the day because I, I am old school to the point that I honestly feel like I'm going to puke if I do any intense cardio uh, with anything in my stomach. Yeah. And I know, and I'm, and I'm wrong for doing that. I'm not, not telling people to follow my example. That's, you know, 50, 51 years of building my mental and physical pathways. That's just how I am. It's not bad. And then you have a great hunger afterwards and you want to feed oh, your yeah. body with good. good one of the great things is lean, you have been fast and you do this work and your body is craving, uh, to be fed and you're not craving. If you've conditioned your body properly, you're not cr like, I, the thought of eating something fried makes me nauseous. Mm -hmm. I haven't had a, like a, a fried chicken wing in I don't know how long. You know, like if I went and had a Big Mac from McDonald's, 
I would like throw up out of my butt for, for I don't know how long. Like I don't even have the enzymes to break that stuff down anymore. But more importantly, I never want it. I never crave it. Like I, I, I haven't had a Coca-Cola in 20 years. So my body knows what it needs to get better, to get faster, to get stronger. And, and it craves and it desires those things. And when you do that work, even on an empty stomach, at the end of it, it's like, ah, oh, give me that nutrients mm -hmm. so I can get stronger and repair the damage that I just did to my body. So when you when you get so you've had your you've had your pre workout and you get mm -hmm. to the gym so then you get there so let's let's talk about what are you doing to warm up are you are you a static stretcher are you a dynamic stretcher are you a I want to get my heart rate going before I do anything else what's what's your approach a little bit of all of the above uh, at Atomic we actually go through movements that we're going to be doing during the workout great plan. Great plan. So everything that when you see the warm up, it'll be like four or five rounds at a lighter weight with a lot of movement. If we're going to be doing sp sprints later, you're going to have a run in there. If we're going to be doing squats, maybe we're doing a goblet squat or a body weight squat. And we're doing these rounds of these movements and these movements are going to mimic what we're going to be doing during our heavy workload. And um, at on it, they have a very similar approach where they know what the workout's going to be. They do movements and dynamic and static stretching in those kind of movement pathways that you're going to be going into. So if we're going to be doing uh, big, heavy deadlifts, we might be doing some some dynamic stretching with uh, Romanian deadlifts or the TRX deadlifts or even maybe even cat kettlebell on block stretches with some box jumps to activate those legs and those hamstrings um, with some light or band assisted pull-ups to activate the back. All the muscles that we're gonna be using, we're activating initially, getting the heart rate up, getting, you're not breathing hard, but the heart is pumping. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that by, time, by the time you step in to do that first round of real work, uh, your body is familiar and prepared to do that movement. And you have blood flow, increased blood flow to those muscles, which is important. You've already taken some, if you had existing lactic acid in there, you've already taken some of it out. You have increased blood flow. You have increased cellular metabolism. You've already taken both oxygen and sugar to the to the uh, to the muscle cells. I don't, I don't want to get too technical. So you're basically you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. So and you mentioned that you know similar programs at Atomic um, uh, and at On It. Have you worked out at OPEX? Yes. You like it? Oh man, I love it. That's actually not. I just found out that's not too far from my house. No, Dave Hall. Yeah. Is incredible. Yeah. He he is not only um, uh, inspiring Green Beret and a combat diver, uh, but he is. A high-level CrossFit, high-level athlete, high-level Olympic lifting, and a high-level coach. Um, it's you know it is a little bit of a drive straight north for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's twenty-five minutes from my house. It's twenty-five minutes from my house. Yeah, uh, Atomic is forty minutes. Yep. Um, on it's probably forty-two. Yep. So it would be the it would be the closest. And I kind of stumbled on it by accident because actually Dave and I. I think we were friends on a couple of different social media and I never really did a deep dive into his business. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at it just recently. So I'm thinking after we get back from this next trip that we have coming up and I'm going to have a block of a few weeks back, I think. Yeah, uh, anytime you're there, I'll, I'll, I'll hop in there with okay, you. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll let you know. The uh, He he has, again, you know, whether I'm at Elevate in New Mexico or at OPEX with Dave or on it or at Atomic, I'm now gravitated and drawn towards these programs, and these are these are smart guys. The, you know, these are not knuckle dragging Cro Magnum men with a fanny pack full of hypodermic needles trying to write programming <laughs> They're for out you. There. There's a lot of them. <laughs> Gold's Gym, Galaxy Fitness, or wherever. You know. yeah. And these are guys that are passionate about um, the individual athlete reaching their individual goals. Mm -hmm. You got to have those goals, and then you have to have the diet, the program, the sleep, and all of the other necessary and the recovery elements to achieve said goals. So let's, and let's talk about it. That was a, actually a perfect segue into the, kind of the next thing I want to talk about is, is uh, and really we already talked about it. I don't, think, I don't even know if we need to illustrate it more, is proper instruction is, you know, YouTube's a great resource for a lot of things, but... There, there's a lot of recipe for disaster there mm -hmm. as far as you could hurt. It's dangerous. Yeah, if you think you're going to go buy Olympic deadlift stuff and put it in your garage and watch a couple of YouTube videos or just, you know, go talk to somebody who, yeah, 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 I can show you everything you need to know. I used to do all that stuff. 
you know, and that's one thing I worry about a little bit with the with uh, some of these CrossFit boxes. That's only like a to 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 own and operate your own CrossFit box. It's like a three day block of instruction, which is a little bit scary to me. That's, yeah, that's scary. You know, that's uh, and that, yeah, that's that's all that's required. You know, and when people uh, dedicate a lifetime to a single lift, and the, that lift is just added into a regular Monday workout. Yeah. Orthopedic surgeons love those CrossFit, CrossFit boxes. Oh yeah, they do. You know? Oh yeah, they've been a they've been a boon for them. Yeah, there's yeah. a there's a lot what of your shoulder, not, your knees, a lot your of back? lot of knee and shoulder replacement oh, is going great. gone on because tell of your this. coach to keep it up. So how do you how do you how do you recommend people sniff? I mean, you you've got the instinct. I know you know you. It, it's like when you and I meet uh, meet the tactical cool guys. We can usually sniff them out. Yeah, you know, in a matter of a couple minutes. How do you do it with the fitness guys? Um, so with a good coach, they don't know everything. They don't. They they are humble enough to say, "Man, I I uh, I haven't looked into that, or I'm not familiar with this, or those are words that your coach should be able to say readily." There's no way that you can know everything about how to train the human body to be bigger, faster, stronger, and harder to kill. So whether it's 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 Juan or Andrew Craig or Isik or Jake Signs or Todd Moore, um, Nick, all of the different coaches that I work with, um, even Greg Jackson, like maybe the most prolific mixed martial arts fighter fighting coach on the planet, like it comes out of his mouth all the time. Man, I need to research that, or I need to look, I need to go back and look at tape, or mm. um, I'm going to dig into that. Those are things that happen fast. When you have that guy that's like, oh no, we're going to do it this way. This is my way. This is the only way. Um, and they don't have substantial, logical, supporting information to back it, mm -hmm. I, I see huge red flags. Mm -hmm. um, if your coach can't do it himself, also a big red flag. You know, if you look at, um, you know, the guys at Atomic, every single one of those coaches from Britt to Todd to Jordan to Jake, they can all do every single one of the workouts at the prescribed time and weight for them, the instructors, which is like 25% heavier or faster mm -hmm. than what the rest of the clients have to do. Right. Um, you know, if you, if you look at like today, my, posting my workout from on it, Juan did the workout with me. Yeah, I saw that. You know, that was, that was Andrew impressive. did the workout with me. Mm -hmm. And like my time was 6.10 or 6.20 on the, on the, the Caribbean Triangle or the Triangle of Death or the Holy Trinity, <laughs> Juan was like 40 seconds behind me. Wow. You know, like he was hanging at a very elite level and he deadlifts more than I do. My training partner can back squat and bench more than I can. Um, you know, Andrew can do a 500 sprint faster than I can. So I'm surrounded with guys that not only know their craft, but they themselves are aspiring in a very humble way to get better versions of themselves. So their journey is not complete. Yeah, that's, that's important. You know, this is, when, when we talk about fitness, you know, I, I'm a physician. I wouldn't, and most people wouldn't, just go to some Yahoo who watched a few YouTube videos when it comes to their healthcare. This is no different. Your fitness is no different than your healthcare. Somebody showing you how to get fit is no different than letting somebody cut you open and take organs out of your body. So you need to make sure that they have the proper training. What do you, what do you think about this? Now, Rogan, uh, Rogan posted something about do this. Do you see Ben Instagram. Shapiro and Rogan? I haven't seen it yet. Don't spoil it's amazing. It. Don't spoil it's it. It's amazing. Don't spoil it's it. It's amazing. I'm listening to it. I got I to gotta do, uh, do a two-hour drive tomorrow, and I'm going to listen to it then. So don't spoil it. Uh, yeah, but, okay, <laughs> don't spoil it. I wouldn't want to talk about it right now because it's like all of these no. things that we say. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know they I know, get I know. into okay. Go ahead. We're Sorry. not we're, we're not talking on. politics today. I know. Next show, <laughs> but you're talking freedom, not politics. I know freedom, freedom. So uh, Rogan talked. Go back. Rogan, Rogan talked about this on uh, on his Instagram today. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw a, a a phrase out there, and I just want you to give me your reaction to it. Okay. Train to failure. Train to failure. What do you what do you what do you think when you hear that? <sighs> to to me, it's you are training to the body's limit mm -hmm. of what it's capable of, mm -hmm. and when you do that, what that limit is will change. Mm -hmm. um, my mind, my heart, will never fail, which is weird. Like 
I will push myself to where my body will break, but my brain wants to keep going. Mm -hmm. And where my heart is like, I'm not going to quit. I'm just going to keep going. And those, those two things are telling my body, no, get back up and keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, ev obviously, evidently, um, it's just not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'll just lay down and essentially die for a little while. But then tomorrow I'm better. I'm stronger. And my body's like, that really sucked. I want to be better prepared for what that was mm -hmm. so that when I reach that wall again, I will be able to go a little bit further. Mm -hmm. So for you, when you're training, do you, uh, do you have to deadlift until that last one, you just couldn't get it all the way up or the last squat, you couldn't get all the way up or the last bench rep or push up or that last kettlebell swing. It's just like, you, there's no way you have another one left in you. Is, does that... Because some people, I think, and this was the point that Rogan was making. So, and, and I agree with everything you just said, but I think some people take the train to muscle failure. Uh, what I worry about when people train to muscle failure, let, you know, let's say it's a squat, is that last rep ends up being shite. I mean, there's the form goes out the window. Uh, that's when bad things happen. That's when knees start bending at angles they're not supposed to bend at. So. Do you think every exercise needs to go to complete muscle failure? No. Yeah, no. And I think that's the misconception. Yeah, so I had this beautifully and much more eloquently than I'm about to explain it, explain to me. Um, so Jake, we are doing a 10 rep max weight. So you kept adding up weight through the course of like th three or four weeks to figure out what your 10 rep max weight was. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of our working load for this next period. So for the next three or four weeks, that 10 rep max, um, for, for me, I think it was 255, mm -hmm. where I could do 10, 10 solid. When I say solid, my posture's never breaking. I'm never going too low. I'm never going too shallow. My elbows are not changing um, angle. My chest is proud. My eye level's perfect. And I can do every single one of those reps flawlessly. The moment that I break one of those fundamental positional requirements, I am now, I've now failed that lift right. and I've now failed my body and I've then failed those muscles. If I do any more, um, I'm out of position and I'm going to damage, hurt or injure myself. Right. I'm not going to get stronger. Nope. So training to failure is training to the point that you have then, you're at a point of diminished returns where you're not going to get stronger. You're just going to get more hurt. And that, and that dovetails into what always goes along with that, which is you should never sacrifice form for that extra rep. If, because if you're sacrificing form, you're not doing that exercise anymore. Oh. You know, and they used to have, so in bodybuilders used to do this thing, and this was a big weeder thing, was they used to call them the, you do the cheater sets on the end. So you can do so many curls and then you can't do anymore. So you swing your hips to get it two thirds of the way up because you're going to get a little bit of extra squeeze out of that part of the muscle that you can still work. And there's a lot of things wrong with that. Uh, and if, and again, it, th there's nothing functional about that because if you have to pick up that weight for real, that's not what you're training. You're training, you want some hypertrophy because you want big freaky, freaky looking muscles that uh, don't have anything to do with whether or not you can use them properly. But I think you were on the exact same page and Rogan was on the same page too, that it's yeah. about, it's not about muscle failing your bicep or tricep for hypertrophy. It's about doing the exercise properly. And, you know, and we're not saying, you know, that you should walk away still feeling like you could do 10 more, but you should walk away knowing that you did all 10 or 15 or whatever it was with the proper execution of form. And if you had gone into one more, that's when you're probably going to sacrifice that form. And a testament to like proper coaching and proper programming and proper diet and proper sleep. And like all of the things that, that we hound on so frequently and, and you know maybe even most importantly, proper recovery was at the end of this period of time where I worked up to my 10 rep max and then I had my 10 rep max and that was my working load for three weeks. Then we retested how many reps we could get with that same rep that was previously my 10 rep max. And I got 19. I like almost doubled right. what I was capable of doing. And I probably could have done another three or four, but I, after one of off, after my eighth rep, um, my hip hinged. So I was 
not perfectly aligned. So my back, my spine wasn't perfectly straight with a proud chest. And when I went down, the, my tailbone curves underneath me a little bit and I came back up, boom, last rep. Coach calls it. Mm -hmm. I had plenty left in my legs. I felt like I could have done another two or three. They would have been really ugly. Maybe I was going to bounce at the bottom. You know, like all of the, the things that could potentially get you hurt. And mm -hmm. that, was, that was the cut point. And uh, so it is a very fine line when we say go all the way to failure. Mm -hmm. It's um, it, it's a kind of a, a counterintuitive expression. Right. You should go right. all the way to failure, but not past failure to a point where you're damaging, diminishing, um, slowing your ability to get strong. And that's why a, pro a proper a proper coach or a properly educated training partner is so important to be that set of eyes for you because in your own wheelhouse, you just know I can do two more. You don't know that last one. My my form was so horrendous on that last one. I was I was calling on muscles that shouldn't be called on for that exercise. I was I was slamming my joints. I was jerking my joints. All the things that you shouldn't be doing. How do you keep your training uh, properly rounded? How do you strike the balance between strength, cardio, flexibility, agility, explosiveness? What what's what's your recipe? So my, my, my goal is the recipe, you know, like, why am I here? The why of the thing? What is the reason for me being in the gym? What is the reason for me sweating? What is the reason for me bleeding? What is the reason for me being on the range? It's so that I won't fail. It's fear that I will let down the guy or the gal to my left or to my right. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that motivation, because of that passion to be perfect, that I can pick up a 250 pound man with a plate carrier and I can throw him on my back and I can run for as long as I need to. Um, because that is such a burning thing in my soul. I would need my training to be perfect. I need my recovery to be perfect. So I go out and I find people that are vastly more intelligent and more educated and more prepared to draft what this program should be like. That should tell me what my pre-workout meal should be, what my post-workout meal should be, when I'm gonna cryotherapy, when I'm gonna ice, when I'm gonna salt bath, when I'm gonna, when I'm gonna hop on a TENS unit, when I'm going to um, you know, use compression sleeves or compression tights, or when I'm going to get a massage, when I'm gonna be rolling, when I'm gonna be static stretching, like when am I gonna go and do yoga, when am I gonna swim, when am I gonna do aerobic, when am I gonna be animal, like blah, blah, blah. it goes on forever. And you can't do it all yourself. You have to have people help you. Mm -hmm. You have to have training partners that are equally motivated. You have to have coaches that are looking for the perfect solution. You have to have a training environment that's conducive to meeting and surpassing your goals. I think one of the one of the great things about yoga, and I think it's started to get, I think, the credit that it deserves because of because of people like Tony Horton, believe it or not, because he did give a lot of uh, wide exposure when he put Yoga X and P90X, because of guys like Mark Devine who puts it in, in his... Tony Horton, I, th I thought it was like Horton Donuts. Different guy? No, Tony Horton, P90X, Tony okay. Horton. So. Okay. So Just kidding. I guess that oh, okay. I was gonna say I guess that tells you how important Tony Horton is when Mr. Fitness himself doesn't know who he is and thinks he's I was kidding. Doing. I was joking. You know what's really sad about Tony Horton is uh, I read his bio. Uh, the worst thing about the, in my opinion, the worst thing about the P90 videos is Tony Horton's terrible sense of humor. He came to California to be a stand-up comic. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad he found fitness. Yeah, because that was not the career for him. Yeah. But uh, so talking about yoga is the great thing about yoga is it works. And, I, and I've said this, I've used this term a lot in this podcast, proprioceptive muscles. So all of these muscles that you don't know, okay, you know, most people know bicep, you know, my, my bicep, my tricep, my pectoralis, you know, most people don't know about, you know, their sartorius muscle, about their psoas muscle, about um, uh, all these little muscles that, you know, the popliteus, all these muscles that are there and they're doing their job all the time, but they're not the big glamour muscles you see on Mr. Olympia, so people don't realize what they are. And these are the muscles that are helping stabilize you. And that's that's one of the huge advantages of yoga is, number one, flexibility. It works a lot of that. And it works all these proprioceptive muscles. You know, when you're 
doing, you know, you know, warrior one, warrior two, reverse yoga or reverse warrior. And, you know, you're doing tree pose and all these other things. You're working all these muscles that you don't normally work. And that is a huge, that, that's like shoring up your joints. You're, you're stabilizing your joints for when you are doing squats and deadlift and, you know, and, uh, clean and jerk, whatever it might be. You're providing all kinds of joint stabilization for when you're doing those prime mover exercises. And I think that's, that's a big reason that I think uh, yoga is so important. And you've seen it embraced so much by guys like you and other professional athletes. Yeah. Um, yoga is important. Stretching is important. Uh, the right yoga with the right coach, with the right gym, with the right partners, all the things still have to be right. Because if you walk into the wrong yoga studio, studio you know, and you're namaste and and like, you know, a couple of kisses on the cheek and then they light the incense and, and then, bong. yeah, and they start banging on the bong. <laughs> the bong, what are those things called? Banging on the bong? Banging on the That's bong. That's a totally different type of okay, yoga studio. What, what is the, uh, the gong? The gong, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I bet some of them are banging on the bong before they walk into yoga. Like what is, while yoga can be an incredible method of injury prevention and helping with mobility and flexibility and endurance. Um, it can also be a complete waste of time. You know, you got to get the right coach with the right uh, motivation, right. you know, with your right, I think what they call them yogis, yeah. like your fellow yoga partners yeah. or whatever cool phrase. Um, well, I, so this is, this is a litmus test that I use is. Uh, Do they what, smell like weed? Is a no, 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 no. Do I, they have no, a gong? It's not a patchouli test. It's when I when I go into a yoga place and they say, "What are your What are your goals? Why Why do you want to take yoga?" And I I just I look them dead in the eye and I say, "So I can be a more efficient killing machine," and I uh. see if they flinch or I say, <laughs> cause, and I told the first time I ever went into yoga, I, they said, "Why do you want to take yoga?" And I said, "Because my triangle choke is terrible." <laughs> I said, "I I need yoga so I can do a proper triangle choke." Yeah. And they were like, okay, that's a valid goal. Yeah. Like, yeah, we, we can relate to that. So, and that's, to me, that's an important litmus test. I mean, it's, and, and I, and there's a lot of things about yoga and about just the practice that I do enjoy, but no, you're absolutely right. Is you have to, you have to, you, you need to be in a room with people who, it, it, they might not be on the same path as you, but at least they have an understanding for your path because otherwise you're going to be doing the type of yoga practice that y you might feel a lot better about yourself and you might get some great meditation in, but you're not going to get as much of the physical aspects uh, out of it. What's, what's your opinion? So when it comes to specifically to injuries, I'm just looking at the time here. We're doing good. Um, my big thing is, you know, the, the saying is as old as time. Know the difference between pain and injury. Pain's good unless it's injury. Right. Unless it's injury, then it's not. Yeah, no, that's a great way to put it. So, and that's, you know, people ask me, well, how do I know? So here's, to me, the really quick test, and this is not 100%, so don't do this and then and then injure yourself worse and then say you're going to sue me for this. Take a hammer. No, 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 okay. no. I was going to say, so Thanks. somebody says my whatever part of my body hurts. I say, okay. If you say it's your calf, okay? Uh, so the, uh, the other day I was running on the treadmill, I got a sudden pain in my calf. That's your first mistake. Right. Go on. I, well, it was. Go on, go on. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It, was, it was the day we were going to Six Flags. We were at the Drury Hotel. So so uh, I stepped off the treadmill. I stopped, you know, because at my age, I'm always, you know, you're, you're always worried, is it the Achilles rupture, right? So I step off. Well, I, I notice if, if I massage, do a deep massage with my thumb, right away it feels better. Okay, that's a muscle cramp. That's not a tear because a tear is going to hurt worse if you put pressure on it. So the general rules that I go by at my age are if something hurts worse, progressively worse, as I am stressing it, you know, like a, a joint injury or a muscular injury, and I'm trying to do even a light workout with that, and it just worse, worse, worse as I progress, that's your body telling you, don't do that. Doc, it hurts when I do this. Don't do that. If it feels better as you move, like oh, the ball on my foot hurts every morning when I get out of bed. But after about five or 10 minutes, it feels a lot better. Well, you probably have a little bit of plantar fasciitis. So what you're doing is re-tearing it, but that is something that you can continue to work through. Or it's, you know, my, my calf hurts until I stretch it out. Okay, well, that, that's fine. You know, you're getting a, a chronic calf cramp or whatever it is. If you can generally do some light motion, some light massage, move the joint 
passively, like you reach down and move your knee or reach down and move your ankle and that makes it feel better. That's your body's way of telling you that's something that you can work through. If it's if it hurts way worse on mile four than it did on mile one, that's damage. That's 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 a meniscal tear. That's that's something you don't want. And if at any point it's causing instability, like you know, when I hear people, well, it made me. I buckled. I went down. Those are injuries. That's not pain. Okay. That's not. That's not. A, that's not a little bit of uh, of thigh discomfort from lactic acid from doing squats. That's your knee is giving out. So that's the point that you need to have a proper orthopedic exam. Same with your shoulder, your elbow. You know, my shoulder clicked and the weight went ka-chunk. It's like, okay, that's your shoulder trying to dislocate itself, okay? <laughs> so joint instability, that's always damage. That's never good. That's never something that you work through. Those are the kind of the general guidelines that I go by. What do, what do you think of that? That's solid. Um, I concur. <laughs> yes, doctor. I concur, doctor. I concur. I concur. Now, what, say, say you have an injury. Mm. Uh, you don't... You don't say that's it, you know, you don't say, oh, I've got a pulled hamstring. I'm not going to the gym until it's better. What do you do? You work, no. you work around those injuries. Yeah, I'm like, but, but don't, but at the same time, don't be afraid to rest the part that's injured. Right? For sure. Like I tore, like actually tore my toe off of my foot, um, blew my ACL in college, uh, wrestling. I, um, you know, jacked up my hands in countless UFC fights. I have, you know, bounced myself off the side of a building wearing body armor while I was hanging from a helicopter. Like these are um, taking my shoulder and like with the, the the plate in my body armor and my shoulder goes up and around the front of your plate. Not good. Not good. Like these are all problems that if I just kept doing what I was doing, things would have just gotten pr incredibly worse. So I did the, the proper recovery and the proper physical therapy mm -hmm. for that muscle or for that joint or for, for that injured thing to get it better faster. I also do very, very disciplined and rigorous preventative maintenance, mm -hmm. like physical therapy to help prevent injuries. So I have really strong joints and I have yeah. very healthy knees and I have really strong hands. And mm -hmm. so I've never you know, like really broken, even in 40 something fights, never broken a bone in my hand. Um, so what types of things do you do for that preventive physical therapy? Like for shoulders, so for for us, um, elbows, shoulders, and knees. You know, like those are and and lower back. Those are reoccurring problems for the operator. You know, I got operator elbow, or I got bad shoulders from this or that. Uh, so I do like um, what looks like a military press up against the wall. You're I'm doing Y's, T's, W's, and L's with very light weights for full range of motions on my shoulders. Um, doing lots of soft tissue, myofascial stuff. Um, in between today, after my workout, and before I went and grappled, and I knew we were going to be doing a lot of judo and a lot of takedowns, I did cryotherapy. So I went and I did an hour and 20 minutes of really physically taxing muscular work, and then I was going to go do some very technical judo and grappling. Uh, and I was like, man, I need, I need to get a lot of great white blood cells into my muscles and some oxygenated blood to help with the recovery. So I help them cry therapy. Um, I'm gonna do like, I'm gonna try red light out on, on, uh, on Saturday. Uh, I do ice baths. Um, I do salt baths. What's I, red light out? So red light is, it's like this, it's a new, as cryotherapy was five years ago, mm -hmm. red light is exposing. They have these special lenses that, um, when you have scar tissue or superficial damage, um, like muscular, that mm -hmm. um, those areas get hot mm -hmm. fast because you have more uh, fluids around those injuries. Mm -hmm. And because they're raised or because they're swollen or because there's more fluid there and they, as they get warmer, more, more blood goes there. And then you go and introduce really cold, mm -hmm. like cold showers or ice baths afterwards and you're getting this big, huge transfusion of blood to these injured areas. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. It's a new, it's a new thing. I'm trying it. Okay. I read about it. I'm not, I'm not, a prom, I'm not promoting it or saying that is good in any way, shape, or form. Um, I love salt baths. I love uh, ice baths. I love cryotherapy. Mm -hmm. I love massages. I love foam rollers. I love deep tissue. I love static stretching. Mm -hmm. I love dynamic stretching. They all have a place and they all have a time and they all have a purpose. 
And, uh, and I do them all. Speaking of, I should have ice bath today. I just didn't have time, so I cried. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's all great info. And I think it's really important for everybody to remember all the things we had. And, and just to harken back on one of the big points that Tim made talking about diet is one of the things that uh, most people probably don't even realize about a healthy diet like the diet that you eat, there's not a lot of pro-inflammatories in it. So a lot of the bad things that we have uh, decided to start putting in our food, and you know, gluten, is, of course, is the most infamous. Gluten is a, is a tremendous pro-inflammatory. And if you're eating a healthy diet and you're getting proper supplementation in that diet, you are in the proper balance between omega-6 and omega-3. You have the proper balance between what is a what is pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. So when, number one, you're preventing injuries before they occur, but number two, if you do get an injury, it's that much easier for you to recover from that because you already have turmeric in your diet. You already have fish oil in your diet. You already have all, all these very important things that are going to help your body to heal properly. So you don't need a lot of Motrin or Tylenol or Aleve or Indocin or Mobic or pain medications or whatever it might be because you've already struck that proper balance with diet. And I, I guarantee your recovery time is a lot shorter than most, most people because you have all of those healthy things already in your body going in. All the time. Yeah, all the time. Yep. So, you know, I so, eat like six times a day, real food. Yeah. You know, Obviously, we've talked about diet extensively in, on other podcasts. If you haven't listened to them, you need to, because um, it is one of the cornerstones about being a healthy warrior, being a healthy defender, being a healthy athlete. And um, one of those four pillars, being diet, like if you're not nailing it, you're, you're, you're just so setting yourself up for failure. You know, recovery and sleep is part of it. You know, doing all of these little tiny things um, that give you that platform, that chassis to do more work. Obviously, the work itself. And then um, just because the kids are present, I'll call it the, the interpersonal relationship that <laughs> that you need to also help for for recovery. It's all and about health. Mental well-being. It is. Yeah, yeah it's all about health and, 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 and mental well-being. And at some point when the kids aren't here, we'll do a whole, whole show that just centers on that. On sex. On stuff, <laughs> on interpersonal stuff. So I think we're leaving it on a good note. Do you have anything you want to add before we shuffle off? Earn your, earn your recovery. You know, uh, that, that's, you know, if your takeaway from Tim Kennedy after what is your program, what does your program look like? Have an intellectual perspective and a desire to seek out the best to contribute to what you're going to be as a person and as an athlete. And if you think that you can go and, and get that full fat butter paleo cup of coffee after your crappy, pathetic, not dripping sweat, bleeding hands workout, you don't deserve it. So earn your recovery. Do the work necessary to need sleep, to need a massage, to need an ice bath. Earn your recovery. Do your work. That's why uh, Mike Dolce doesn't ever refer to it as the cheat meal. He refers to it as the earned meal. Yeah, earn yeah. it. And then, and it's not, you know, the emphasis on, we'll do a, another whole podcast on diet specifically. We might even have Dolce on. Um, he talks about specifically, you know, the, the earned meal doesn't mean a Big Mac. That means, you know, maybe more, more of the healthy food with a little bit of you know, straying outside, you know, coloring outside the lines, but not freaking out and going to Baskin Robbins is just going completely crazy. All right, man. I hope everybody enjoyed it today. Um, we had a lot of requests for this topic. We had already talked about fitness and then uh, decided to go into this today. So I hope everybody got something. I hope you took some notes. I have noticed uh, some of you following us online are doing really well, taking notes and then publishing those notes in the forum, which I really appreciate, man. That's pretty awesome. That's yeah, like I, want, I actually want you to send those to me. I know because like did it's I like really the, say yeah, that? The, yeah. Did I say that? That's a great yeah. point. It reminds me we used to have in uh, in meds. We didn't do this in my med school, but a lot of med schools have what's called scribe service, and y'all and like uh, like if you and I sign up for scribe service, I have to show up for for X lecture. You have to show up for Y lecture, and then we have to take notes, and then we trade them. 
Mm-hmm. So, and that's what it reminded me. It reminded me of Scribe Service. So, great stuff, everybody, man. I'm glad you guys are getting something out of it. And keep them coming with, you know, the, you know, hit us up on social media or via email. Let us know what you want us to talk about. And uh, I'm going to go back to closing with a quote for a little bit. We did, we missed a couple episodes where we did that, but I'm going to do one today. And I'm going to quote the legendary Jack LaLanne, who most of you probably don't even remember who he was. So he was a fitness guru before there were fitness gurus. And he once said, probably millions of Americans got up this morning with a cup of coffee, a cigarette, and a donut. No wonder they are sick and fouled up. Get out of the grind, everybody. Get out of the grind you're in and embrace the grind of health. And until next time, be a sheepdog. You have been listening to The Sheepdog Project. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash sheepdog response. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the individual and do not represent any larger entity, public or private.